Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you because of the sound of victory. We thank you because of the song of victory. And we thank you, Lord, because of your power. In every child of God, every minister, every member of your glorious, victorious church. As Lord, you are marching on and we know it's going to be victory and conquering on the final day. Every one of us will share of that victory. Lord, without any weakness. Lord, without any vacillation. And without any thinking dilly-dally. Lord, we're going to stand firm. And we're going to march after the captain of our salvation in Jesus' name. Once again, empower your people. Energize your people. Strengthen your people. Lord, we shall not fail. We shall not fall. We shall not falter. We'll march on until the victory is won on every side in Jesus' name. Well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. God bless you. The Lord be with everyone. We thank the Lord for this retreat. The retreat that has the theme, power for the present hour. And I pray that as we go out at the end of the retreat, and as we have heard from our choir, that the Lord is marching on. And the church too is marching on. We shall win the victory. Somebody there said we have won the victory. We have a home. We have a goal. We have a destination. We have a destiny. And we're moving on. And we're pursuing. And we're going after that final home that final habitation, that paradise, that heaven, and thank God, nothing will stop us in the way. That's why we come to the message as we close this wonderful retreat, the pursuit and the destiny of an empowered church, the pursuit and the destiny of an empowered church church we're talking about the church christ spoke about the church matthew chapter 16 reading from verse 18 matthew chapter 16 verse 18 and i say unto thee that thou art peter and upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it you believe that say amen. amen refer to the church as his church he says it's my church and he says it's the one building that church and he says i built the church on the rock and the gates of hell though they may fight they will not prevail against the church he mentions the church in various ways. Number one is the flock with a shepherd. Number two is a fold or somebody overseeing that fold. Number three is the family. Number four is the fellowship. Number five, the church is an assembly. Number six, the church is an habitation. Number seven, the church is a temple. Number eight, the church is a congregation. And it brings people together as a family, members of the family. As a flock, sheep in the flock. As a fold, people that the Lord has brought into the same habitation. Habitation indwelt by God. But he says, those individual members, they are called out people. It's not the world. 
Is not the hypocrites worshipping, saying they are worshipping God. It's not a collection of Judases. It's not a collection, a group of demons and demons and demons. It's not a collection, an assembly of people that are made up of Ananiah and Sapphira. These are not people that congregate together as Achan, as Balaam, as Korah, as Cain, and they just come to offer a kind of sacrifice. These are called out people. These are cleansed people. These are converted people. These are committed people. These are the people that the Lord called out. I will build my church. It's not a congregation that is made up of rich young rulers. What can I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And the Lord told him. And then he went away sorrowful because he couldn't obey the watch of the Lord. They go to church and they ask about the way of life eternal. And when the standard comes, and when the Lord maps out the way to get into that kingdom, they're so rich, they become eternally poor. And the church is not a congregation of people that will say, that will pray, let me die the death of the righteous, but not willing to live the life of the righteous. The church, I will build my church. They are the congregation. The assembly, the flock, the fold, the temple, the habitation, the household of people who are called out of sin, out of the defilement in the world, and they are called to come into fellowship, in need, a united fellowship. And these are the people that only can be referred to as the church of the living God and the church of Christ and empowers them empowers them because they have a goal and they have an assignment and they have a duty they have something he has appointed for them to do and they exist only for that they are not existing to satisfy the world or to please the devil or to please anyone, they exist to please the Lord and to follow after the Lord. The pilgrims going to heaven, they are strangers in this world and they are citizens of the kingdom of God. They are the people that look at Christ going in front of them. And the Lord is not just dragging on, is marching on with confidence because he knows the result at the end of the day. And the church is the one that has risen up saying, we're following after him and we're marching after him. This church will be his church. I will march on to victory in Jesus' name. One goal to pursue. One destiny to run after. After we're empowered in the strength of the Lord. Empowered by the word of the Lord. Empowered by the spirit of the Lord. Empowered by the indwelling Christ that dwells in us and says this is the way walk ye in it and as we look at this we want to understand that we're not just here and we're just ro we're not roaming around we're going to a particular place that he himself spoke about john chapter 14 from verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go to prepare a place for you. That's our destiny. That's our destination. That's our habitation final. That's heaven. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That, listen to this, that where I am, there ye may be also the destiny of an empowered church. Where I am, there ye will be also. In John chapter 17, reading from verse 14. John chapter 17, verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray for them. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world. They are called out of the world. They are not of the world. They are cleansed from the world. They are not of the world. They live contrary to the world. They are not of the world. They refuse to compromise with the world. They are not of the world. They have chosen to conquer the world. They are not of the world. They are here to convert the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. It's in heaven right now. And he says, Father, I saved them. I sanctified them. I empowered them that they will be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovedst me before the foundation of the world. And so you understand the church, the empowered church, having a pursuit, moving on, marching on, until we get to that final destiny. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the precondition and marks of concourse. The precondition and marks of concourse. Now, number two is the pursuit of mastery for the crown. When we get home on the other side, it's promised to us that if we conquer, and we have the marks of the conquerors. Knowing the precondition to become a conqueror. And we follow that. And we pursue that. It says there's going to be a crown at the end of the journey. The pursuit of mastery for the crown. Number three. The perseverance and model of our captain is gone before and he has as he has gone before us he shows us the way and he says he wants us though the false prophet shall arise he wants us they will deceive many he wants us because iniquity shall abound he wants us the love of many shall wax cold but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's why we need to keep on moving on. 
standing firmly, uncompromisingly, so that everything we have heard, everything we have known, and the precondition is set before us, will follow that and follow through to the end. The reason why God has brought us here is so that he will give us the precondition and the marks and the things that determine the people who are pilgrims of the Lord and pilgrims to heaven and they're going to get there on the final day. And we must keep that in our mind, keep that in our memory. Look at what the scripture says. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. It says, by which ye are kept saved. By which you remain saved. By which you constantly experience the energizing power of the saving Christ. If you keep in memory that which I preach unto you. What are the marks of the pilgrims who are marching on to heaven? What do we know about them? Number one, we know about their sonship. And daily victory over sin. Keep that in memory. Keep that in memory. Keep that in memory. Temptation will come. The persuasion of the enemies will come. The people that want to derail you from the kingdom, they will come. And the people that want to divert your attention to non-essentials, they will come. You keep in memory what you have heard so that that will keep you saved you'll stand saved you'll be firm saved you'll be moving on saved and there'll be no day in your life that that assurance of salvation and that mark of salvation and that power that god has given you here there'll be no day that thing will leak out of your life keep it in memory that there must be the assurance of sonship and daily victory over sin. John chapter 1, reading from verse 12. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, they turned away from Satan. They turned to the Savior. They turned away from sin. And they turned to righteousness. They turned away from the broad way. And they faced the narrow way that leads unto life. They turned away from the world. And they faced the Lord. And they say, he will be my savior. He will be my Lord. As many as received him. They received him totally. They are not receiving him partially. As my healer but not my savior as my provider but not my sanctifier as my deliverer but not my baptizer they received him they received him. the totality of christ you are not dividing christ you are not killing christ and dismembering him you are not limiting christ as many as received him what I know of him today, I receive him. What I know of him tomorrow, I receive him. What he will yet tell me about himself, I receive him. I sign an empty, clean, vacant sheet of paper at the bottom. I put my name, I put my signature. I say, Lord, write anything you want to write. I've signed my name already. I receive you now. And whatever you tell me, whatever you show me, wherever it please, Lord, I receive you. As many as received him, not, Lord, they say you can save. 
I hope that's all you do. Okay, I receive you now. Don't tell me any other thing I will not receive. Don't show me any other path I will not receive. Don't show me you are king, you are lord, you are governor, you are ruler. I will not accept. I receive you. In the limitation of what I know now, I receive you. And then, in whichever way you will reveal yourself, you have the divine ownership of me. As many as receive the Lord without reservation. To them, he gave the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believed on his name. After receiving him like that, if you then turn around later, and you limit him. I will say, uh-uh, Lord. Uh-uh, Savior. Uh-uh, Healer. Uh-uh, Deliverer. A Sanctifier. I don't think I want to receive that one. In Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 41. 78, verse 41. Yea. They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. You receive him and you promise him in your totality, your entirety, in your offices and in your provision. As a commander, as a captain, I receive you now the limit I know. But now, I promise you, I receive you totally for the rest of my life. You don't limit him. Those are the sons of God. And those sons of God, they have daily victory over sin. First John chapter 3. In First John chapter 3, reading from verse 1. First John chapter 3 verse 1. Behold... What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. A Christian is not a sinner. A sinner is not a Christian. A private sinner, not a Christian. Office sinner, not a Christian. Sinner in a marriage relationship, that's not a Christian. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because is born of God. Those are the people going to heaven. Verse 10 in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5 verse 18 We know that whosoever is born of God, sinneth not. Born again, sinneth not. The old lie of sinning erased, taken out of the way. His mind is no more there. His heart is no more there. His life is no more there. We know from experience. We know 
by his grace we know in his power we know because of his presence we know that whosoever is born of god sinneth not but he that is begotten of god keepeth himself and that wicked one touches him not the precondition and the marks of conquerors number two these are people that understand divine ownership and absolute surrender the pilgrims we are talking about that the people that understand divine ownership and absolute surrender he gave his life for me i give my heart my soul my mind my present my past my future my plans my dreams i give unto him those are the pilgrims the marks of the conquerors he merits that he demands that he desired that he commands that proverbs chapter 23 reading from verse 26 proverbs 23 verse 26 my son you start with sonship my son you listen to the father my son you obey his command my son you respond to his demand speak lord i'm hearing my son give me don't give it to the world give me don't give it to satan give me break the covenant you have with society and you've sold your heart your soul to them give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways the marks of the conquerors you're not observing this and observing that you hear just one voice you respond to one command and it's the command of the heavenly father and he says my son give me your heart and then when you give me your heart from that time you not let your eyes observe the ways of the lord in first corinthians chapter 6 first corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 and 20 what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which ye have of god and ye are not your own i live my life the way i like it's not your life ye are not your own i spend my money the way i want to spend my money is ye are not your own i will go anywhere i want to go ye are not your own i'll give to the lord if i have the liberty otherwise i have this and this and that you are not your own for ye are bought with a price therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit which are gods these are the people that understand i'm giving to the lord i'm sold to the lord i'm bought by the lord i belong to the lord entirely and i give myself and everything i have to him for his kingdom for his service in second corinthians chapter 8 verse 1 moreover brethren we do you to wit we do you to know we do you to understand of the grace of god bestowed upon the churches of macedonia how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and deep poverty it was a time of distress a time of recess a time of famine a time of nationwide scarcity and yet the abundance of grace abounded unto the riches of their liberality 
For to their power I bear you record, yea, beyond their power. They were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon the fellowship upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints and this they did nobody coerced them they just understood that they belonged to the lord entirely or reservedly and they were to live for the lord every day of their lives because it says and this they did not as we hoped but first gave their own selves to the lord and unto us by the will of god the lord is saying if you are going to keep safe you've heard about that keep it in memory Keep it in memory that he demands humility and lowliness. Humility and lowliness. That's his lifestyle. And he says, have you heard that? The way I lived in lowliness and humility. He says, if you're going to be saved, finally, keep that in mind. Matthew chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 29. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. That's not an option. That's not a suggestion. That's not an opinion. That's not a denominational doctrine. Take my yoke upon you. You know, there are people that live as if there is no yoke to bear. No restriction of what to say, where to go, how to dress, how to comport themselves. It's like there's no yoke, there's no command, there's no restraint, there's no restriction in their lives. They never know how to say no to something coming out of their mind. Say this, act this way, go this way. They never say no to anything. They don't take the yoke of Christ on them. They think that, you know, you get from Christ is healing, deliverance, miracle, signs and wonders, and then strength to go back home and serve the devil. It says, no, that this is the life I live as your Savior, as your Lord. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly. And then he tells us and you shall find lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. He tells us what happens to those who are not humble. They won't get into the kingdom. They don't have the precondition and the marks of those who conquer. Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. And whosoever, bishop, and whosoever, preacher, and whosoever, minister, and whosoever, a man of great position, indispensable in the church, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. But he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. It demands that. And it tells us if the qualification you are saved, you are born again, show it by that humble, lowly heart and life. Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You're saved. You're going to heaven. Let this mind be in you. The mind of humility and the mind of lowliness. You don't want to be so involved with the work of the Lord that the Lord of the work sees you as proud 
egoistic, self-centered, self-exalting, and lording things over the whole church, imposing yourself on the church, that you now replace Christ, the head of the church. Be humble. If you don't want to just be, you know, elevated here, up and up and up, and then you don't have the chance to get to heaven, come down. See that wristwatch in your hand. It's useful when it stays in its place. If you will put that wristwatch in the place to put the big bang that is on a tower. And then you put that wristwatch there. And we look at it. We can't see anything. Because that little wristwatch that is useful as long as it's here in our hand, very close to us, humble and lowly, will be useful. Lift it up. Exalt it. Raise it up to the place and the point of the big bend that is up there. The wristwatch is no more visible to us. We cannot see it anymore. It's no more useful. And if you're going to remain useful, we're going to be lowly. We're going to be humble. Because it says that Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. And people are always announcing who they are, what they do, what position they hold, so and so and such and such. Christ made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of his servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself. God did not humble him. He humbled himself. Satan did not humble him. He humbled himself. The disciples did not humble him. He humbled himself. The church did not humble him. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. That's what the Lord is telling us. If you're going to demonstrate the marks of the conquerors, James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 6. James chapter 4 verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud. If you come to render service to the children of God in any way, and there's pride behind that ministration whatever the ministration if there is arrogance pride here i am i come again here i am you didn't know i'll be here i'm here and listen to me i'm the one on stage at this time receive it if you want to be blessed god Resistes the proud. He'll resist your usefulness. You might be there. You might be there. And you'll be like the can of sardine that once were eating what is inside there. You're thrown away, you're cast away. It takes humility. What's your gain? If you're proud, self exalting for 50 years. Is a man of the hour. Is a big shot. And then after 50 years, we get up the stage and we look for you in heaven. We cannot find you. <clears throat> but he giveth grace, more grace. Wherefore he says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Giveth grace to the humble. He says, submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil. He wants to make you proud, and he will flee from you. Verse 10, humble yourselves, therefore, 
in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, ye, all of you. Be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season. The precondition and the marks of conquerors, sonship, and daily victory over sin, divine ownership, and absolute surrender, humility, and lowliness. Number four, daily bridle on the tamed tongue. Daily check on the tamed tongue. Daily limitation on the tamed tongue. Many people don't understand that they don't say everything that occurs to them. Many people don't understand there are times to talk, there are times not to talk. Many people profess to have great, great, great Christian experiences, saved, sanctified, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and yet they do not know that the tongue can nullify, destroy, defile and stop their chance of getting to heaven many people don't understand you can learn a lot know a lot have a lot go a long way and yet your tongue can ruin you and destroy you that's why as we're looking at the precondition and the marks that will help us and get over there to the final destiny. You want to understand your tongue plays a major role. Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, I read from verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word, your mind is idle. Your heart is roaming here and there. Everything is quiet. It's an idle moment. Nothing is moving. Nothing is taking place. And we think, I must break the ice. I must break the silence. There's an idle moment. Let's while away the time. And then words to no profit comes out of your mouth. Words to no good intention comes out of your mouth. The brain is just wondering. The mind is just wondering. And everything eternal is roaming about here and there. And then you open your mouth. And I say unto you. That every idle word that men speak. They shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. If you knew that God listened to every conversation, if you knew that God records every conversation, if you would remember that God will bring those words back to you on the day of judgment, you'll check your mouth, check your lips, check your tongue. James chapter 1, reading from verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bride, let not his tongue. Ah, I had that before. You had that before. Have you done it? I had that message before. You had that message before. What change has it made on your conversation, on your discussion? 
on your lifestyle what were you saying before the, that message came to you and you have stopped saying i heard those messages before you had them before how what change has it made what decision have you taken what consecration commitment have you made what transformation has it done since that time do you think about the day of judgment no you don't that's what the lord is telling us again and he's telling us these are the preconditions and the marks of the conquerors those who come here and they have the power the power to overcome i will overcome in jesus name i said i will overcome in jesus name you overcome in jesus name if any man preacher overseer if any man member of deeper life if any man among you seem to be religious and bright let not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart this man's religion is vain chapter 3 verse 1 my brethren be not many masters be not many teachers be not many counselors be not many proclaimers knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation for in many things we offend all if any man if any woman if any minister if any member offend not in word the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body the marks and the precondition of the people who get to heaven faithfulness fellowship and transparency in the family faithfulness fellowship transparency in the family as we are nearing the end of the journey I'm not talking of end of the year I'm not talking of end of the retreat end of the journey because of the signs that we see all around us we need to bring back to mind everything that is essential in helping us to get to heaven it's not the time to learn non-essentials. It's not the time to preach non-essentials. It's not the time to waste our life. Just study the Bible. Just have knowledge in the head. Something practical. Something you know, that will pursue. That will help us to get to heaven. If you are married. Even if you are not married. The faithfulness. The fellowship. The transparency. In the family. Husband and wife. Hiding from each other. Husband and wife. Living separate lives. Different lives. It's like the man has this conviction. The woman has this conviction. Different. And the two shall be one. It's like the man has this understanding of holiness. The woman has her own understanding in a limited way. Of holiness it's like the husband is reading the authorized version of the Bible the wife is reading the revealed reversed version of the Bible he re she reverses everything she reveals everything they don't have the same conviction they might be in the same church living in the same home but the faithfulness to understand there's only one way that gets to heaven and we must be faithful to the conviction of the word of God without that we we'll labor in vain it says we must be faithful you're married faithful to God faithful to the word faithful to your husband faithful to your wife 
faithful at home, faithful when you are away from home, in your office. And whatever you do, you do it as if, if you are a man, if my wife is here. When I do this, when I say this, when I touch this, when I accept this gift, and the same thing, my husband were here, if my wife were here, will I say what I'm saying? Will I give myself to what I give myself? Or do I have a different conviction that man is a man of the Bible? I'm a woman of the world. You are going to different places then. You are not going to where that man is going. Faithfulness. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading verse 45. Matthew chapter 24 verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season faithfulness we're looking at luke he wants us to be faithful in small things in big things as well in the family once you're married you're no more an independent man you're no more an independent woman you're attached to your husband Luke chapter 16, reading from verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least, she that is faithful in that which is least, is also faithful in that which is much. And he that is unjust, she that is unjust, he that is unfaithful, she that is unfaithful in the least is unjust. And also unfaithful in much. He wants faithfulness. He wants fellowship. He wants transparency. Hebrews chapter 13. Reading from verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled. But all mongers and adulterers, God will judge. He demands faithfulness from husbands and wives to each other, to the word of God, and to the Lord. And he demands fellowship. Fellowship that is peculiar only to the husband and the wife. What you give to the man. That you can never give even an appearance of it to any other man. What you give to the woman. That you cannot give even a shadow of it unto another woman. That's what you're saying. That's the word of God. And you're transparent. Transparent. Not that, you know, I'm doing this. He will not know. He must not know. I'm going this way. She must not know. She must not have sight of this. It tells us in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 58. In Isaiah chapter 58. Verse 7. It's not there, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And then not bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him. Look at this now. Transparency. And that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Who is thine own flesh? Your husband, your wife. That thou hideth not thyself from thy flesh. They must be living with conviction, without compromise. The world wants to mold us, squeeze us into their mold. 
They want us to obey them. They don't recognize the lordship of Christ. And if you say, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, I'm following after the Lord, they may keep quiet and then they will do things that will bend you. If it doesn't bend you, will break you. And bend and break and then squeeze you into their mold. But if you're a pilgrim to heaven, no matter what you will suffer, and no matter the persecution, you say, I'm a man of conviction. I'm a Christian of conviction. I will not compromise. They want you to deny the Lord. You will not deny the Lord. I thought somebody there will say, Amen. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Reading from verse 33. Matthew chapter 10 verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which he is in heaven. There are people that they belong, they, they are in this church, but they believe eternal security. There are people, they are in our congregations. They act and they live as if I'm saved, I'm saved. Whatever is preached, whatever I read in the Bible, whatever warning comes, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. However I live, wherever I go, whatever happens to me, I'm saved. They deny the Lord, I'm saved. They compromise, I am saved. Uh -uh, you're not saved. Here is the Savior. Here is the Lord himself. Look at what he says, whosoever, Daniel in Babylon, whosoever, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylon, whosoever, Moses before Pharaoh, whosoever, Joshua before the Amalekites, whosoever, Saul sent her out to go and destroy the Amalekites, whosoever, Mary, Elizabeth, anybody, whosoever, demons in the world whosoever whosoever shall deny me before men men are so strong stronger than your savior men are so big bigger than your lord and men are so imposing fearful fearsome and you fear them more than the lord and because of that i cannot stand they are frown. They are not even spoken. They just look at you kind of way. And then you become afraid. You forget your Lord. And you deny your Lord. Are you so weak? You are not empowered. You are not energized. You cannot face the fury of a Pharaoh. And you cannot face the fury of a Nebuchadnezzar. You say you are going to heaven and you fear a rat stopping your way and you take the rat to be a lion and you say you want to get to glory to the same place that Stephen went and then somebody, they wave a broom of stick, a stick of broom in your face and they lift it up and you fear that broom of stick of broom and then you deny the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Let them do what they will do. Say what they will say. Act the way they will act. Persecution, let it come. Suffering, let it come. Pain, let it come. We're going to heaven. And he has chosen us to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We will not compromise. I will not compromise. Where is the challenger? And where is the one that can stop me? On the way to heaven, I have chosen the path of righteousness. I have chosen the way, the way of righteousness. I will not deny the Lord. What are they going to give you? Certificate? 
forget about that money forget about that empty commendation you want their praise it has no value forget about that and say he is my lord he is my king he is my savior the captain of my salvation i will not deny the lord somebody there i will not deny the lord i said i will not deny the lord you will not deny him in jesus name first peter chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 11 first peter chapter 2 verse 11 Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Verse 21, for even here unto what ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. Get ready for the suffering. And tell the devil, I can be a more than that. The fire is on, I can be a more heat than that. The lashes at your back, go on, Satan, I can endure more than that. that that's nothing in comparison of the glory that is set before us. And Christ has given us an example that you should follow after his steps. Number one, the precondition and the marks of conquest. Number two now. Point number two. The pursuit of mastery for the crown. If we're going to win the crown, we must pursue. Pursue. Pursue that crown and have the mastery. In First Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, come back to verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, and one receiveth the prize, so run that she may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery, is temperate in all things. Every man that striveth for the mastery, when a race, and was striving for the mastery, and we want to get to the end where we win the crown, striving for the mastery, will be temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so on. Not as uncertainly, so fight I. Not as one that beateth the air. You want to have the mastery, win the mastery, gain the mastery. I keep my, I keep under my body. Have you seen those people just carefree, nonchalant, careless, free? It's like. Not even a sprinkle of the word of God has splashed on them. They don't control what comes out of their lives. There's no restriction. There's no restraint. They are as free as when they were in the world. But Paul the apostle says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I have preached to others lest that by any means when I preach to others preachers workers ministers lest that by any means when I preach to others I myself should be a cast away. I pray you'll not be a cast away. Striving for the mastery. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong 
in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangles himself with the fears of this life. No man that worries. The people who want to get to heaven we have always maintained this and we still do. We're not changing the word of God. Pilgrims on their way to heaven don't get involved with the politics of this world. I want to help my people. I want to rule my people. I want to do this. I want to do that. Good intention. They'll suck you into the system. There's idolatry. There's occultism. A lot of things you may not see on the surface. If it's your desire that you want to reign with the Lord, let it wait. You rule and reign at that time. Let it be understood. A real child of God on his way to heaven, you will not take a chieftaincy title from the people of the world. My people want me to come and govern them, rule them. They want to make me their traditional ruler. You'll perish of that tradition. It's going to be an uphill task for you to say, I'm going really about the people and trust me, no idolatry. No, I don't trust you. Trust me, no occultism. No, I don't trust you. You don't get entangled with the traditions of this world. And don't let anybody say, and so and so is a member of a great church and is, uh, you know, having that chieftaincy title. Are you following him or following Christ? No man that worries and tangles himself with the fears of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Look at verse 5. And if any man, if a man also strive for the masteries, if a man also strive for masteries, yet you see not crouch, except to strive lawfully. Pilgrims are not easygoing people seeking after the things of the world or the praise of men. The people who came out of the world and their claims stand totally removed from the world. And now they are walking in the narrow way that leads to heaven. They don't indulge the flesh. They don't please the world. They pursue mastery. And because of that, number one, they crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh Galatians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 20 Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 I'm crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me Number two, they put the body under, the tongue under, the hands under, the feet under, the flesh under, the body and the deeds of the body. They put that under. Number three, they abstain from all appearance of evil. Not because church leadership will discipline me, forget about that. Who is going to discipline you? Who knows about your giving in to appearance of evil? Not because the people who are looking at me, they'll say this or that. 
get rid of that opinion of me that doesn't matter but because you want to get to heaven and because there's a god in heaven that is watching you and because there's a christ that is saying i wouldn't do that i wouldn't do that be my follower and follow the example i have laid we're looking at first thessalonians chapter 5 first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22 abstain the command abstain from all appearance of evil number four you flee youthful lusts flee youthful lusts there's some people that feel that some verses of the bible they are only for teenagers flee youthful lusts but you understand david was not a teenager when he did what he did with Beersheba, or the captain of an army, or the killer of a Goliath, and was the ruler over the people. Yes, for laws, it's not limited to those who are teenagers, those who are in their 40s, those who are in their 70s. Yes, for laws, it's everywhere. For everyone, flee. Yes, for laws. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Number five, deny self while others are denying Christ. Deny self. While others are denying Christ. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said unto them all, If any man, if any man, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Number six, resist the devil and other adversaries of the faith. Resist the devil and other adversaries of the faith. First Peter chapter 5. Verse 8, be sober, don't be careless. Be sober, don't be frivolous. Be sober, don't be carefree, not challenge. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom receives steadfast in the face, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplishing your brethren that are in the world. Number seven. Reject the gaze of corruption. Reject the gaze of corruption. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Reading here from verse 18. Acts chapter 8 verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles hands the holy ghost was given he offered the money saying give me also this power that on whosoever i lay hands he may receive the holy ghost but peter said unto him the money perish with thee because thou was taught that the gift of god may be purchased with money Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Peter rejected that gain of corruption. Number eight, lay aside all weights and besetting sins. Lay aside all weight and besetting sins. Hebrews. Chapter 12, 
reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12. We're reading here from verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every weight. The things that impede your progress spiritually. The things that slow you down spiritually. The things that weigh on you and you cannot run the race the way you ought to run. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience, perseverance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Number nine, burn the bridges behind you. You've crossed over. You've come to Christ. And the bridge behind you, the link, the connection, with the past you destroy everything burn the bridges behind you acts chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 18 acts chapter 19 reading from verse 18 in verse 18 it says many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds and many of them also, which use curious acts, brought their books together and punched them. Occultism. The things they did in the past, or they might have said, were converted. We don't have any mind to go to those things anymore. If they left all those things there without burning them, a, tempt a, kind, a day of temptation might come. And that day of temptation is like uh, we're praying and there's nothing that seems to be working. And then you see those books there, they might go back to them. But you burn the connection between you and your past. They burnt them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found the age 50,000 pieces of silver. Number 10, cut off the right hand of offense. Cut off the right hand of offense. What does that mean? The words of Jesus, Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's not talking about forgiveness or not forgiveness. You forgive the people that offend you. If there is somebody as precious as your right eye, if there's somebody as useful as your right eye, if there is somebody as tender, affectionate as your right eye, if there is something, so much part of you, like your eye, but it's causing you to backslide. It's causing you not to be 100% devoted unto the Lord. And it's going to derail you and destroy your consecration. That's what he's talking about. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. And if thy right hand, very useful, and if thy right hand, a right hand of activity, and without that right hand, looks like you cannot make physical, natural, human, earthly progress. They are very, very important to your earthly existence. But they cause you to backslide. And they're always getting you back, getting you back to where you're coming from. And the Lord said, if thy right hand offend thee, 
cut it off cast it from thee for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell those are the words of jesus number 11 and deal persecution it will come and deal persecution persecution will come it will come from some places you already know you expect it will also come from some places you never never dreamt of you never knew so and so will oppose your way of righteousness and the way to life eternal i thought he's a christian i thought she's a bible believing woman and yet when you carry out conviction persecution will come you never expected it will come from that direction and deal and deal because we're talking about getting to heaven you will get there in jesus name Somebody, I said, you'll get there in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 2. Reading from verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Number 12. Prevail over hellish corruptors. The people that want to corrupt you and take you to hell, you will prevail over them. That's why we came for power. It's not just power to shout. It's not power to get into a corner somewhere in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. No, it's a power. The power that walks silently, quietly, unassuming. And the danger is there. And the difficulties and challenges are there. The power and the courage to be valiant and move on in the presence of the midst of those dangers and still overcome. You prevail in Jesus' name. And those hellish corruptors, they will not corrupt you. I thought our people would say, Amen. Second Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. Nothing will bring you back into bondage in Jesus' name. Point number three. The perseverance and model of our captain. The perseverance and the model of our captain. The Lord has gone before us. And the Lord has left us the example. And he shows us how to persevere until the very end. Hebrews chapter 2. Our captain, our captain, the captain of our salvation. Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory. That's what he wants to do. The sons of God. He wants to bring us to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That was the model he left. That's the example he left. That the suffering did not perplex him, did not make him to yield or to turn back, but perfected him and were to follow in perseverance that model. We're looking at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. 
It says, and it came to pass. This is a captain. This is the one we are following. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Crucifixion was awaiting him. Betrayal awaiting him. Trouble awaiting him. Rejection of the people awaiting him. The snares of the people are which he knew what awaited him in Jerusalem. But he said, This is the will of my father. And he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. And he is our example. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. That's an example. Despising the shame, belittling the shame, minimizing the shame, ridiculing the shame, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. See, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And the Lord is telling us that he's left that example for you, for me, for us. In Philippians chapter 2 again. Philippians chapter 2. Reading from verse 5, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, that you follow his example, let this mind be in you. The mind of commitment to, to the Lord all the time. If this cup will not pass by me, except I drink it, Father, thy will be done. Let this mind be in you. This difficulty is there, this problem is there, and yet I'm following, I'm following the Lord. You can take it away. If you are not taking it away, Lord, thy will be done. Yet I will serve you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I pray that you possess the mind of Christ in Jesus' name. John chapter 12, verse 49 and verse 50. John chapter 12, verse 49. For I have not spoken of myself. I have not acted of myself. I have not done anything of myself. That's Christ. And you want to be conscious of that every time. That self is now crucified. Self is now gone. And because of that you live only for him. And you do that which pleases him only all the time. Here is your model. Here is the example. Here is what we are to pursue. Here is our perseverance. For I have not spoken of myself. But the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. As the Father said unto me, so I live. As the Father said unto me, so I persevere. As the Father said unto me, so I pursue. And as I pursue like that, eventually, one glorious day, the trumpet will sound. You'll be there up in Jesus' name. Let not your hearts be troubled. Persecution, don't let your heart be troubled. Confusion in the land, let not your heart be troubled. Recession, let not your heart be troubled. Persecution, let not your heart be troubled. Misunderstanding, let not your heart be troubled. Misinterpretation, let not your heart be troubled. And the opposition of the people that do not know the way of righteousness and holiness, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. For you. For you. For you. What will be strong enough to take you away from that place? To divert your attention from that place. And to move you away from the path that leads to that place. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. It's coming again. I said it's coming again. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will be also. I will be there. Where are you? I will be there. Where are you there? I will be there. Why don't you stand up? I will be there. Tell the Lord, I will be there. Many things between now and that time, but I will be there. Many things between here and the crown, I will be there. Many things between now and that coronation day, I will be there. Many things that may happen between now and that day of resurrection and that day of the rapture and that day when the Lord will come and then they will take his saints home and I will be there. Tell the Lord you'll be there. Tell the Lord you'll be there. Tell the Lord you'll be there. If you keep all these things in memory, keep all these things in memory, keep all these things in memory, the Lord is saying, he wants you to so walk and to so live like a pilgrim that nothing will turn you around. He goes to, he has gone to prepare a place for you so that where he is, there you will be also. Tell the Lord, nothing will stop your journey. Nothing will derail you. Nothing will discourage you. Nothing will destroy the commitment you have made to the Lord. He's going to prepare a place for you. You'll be there.